Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to worship. I welcome those who are in the room. I welcome all of you who are worshiping with us online. It is good to be with you this week. This last week here at the church campus, it got really, really loud. Uh, we hosted the Montlure Day Camp, and we want to show you a video and give you a little flavor of what happened amongst all the kids this week. So let's watch this video. kids really had a great time. There were over 25 or more kids that were here all week, and it was just a great time, and I thank you for the ways that you give to the church that give us space to offer those day camps, and the kids just study the Bible, and they figure out what it means to be in Christian fellowship, and they just have a great time all week, and it, it's just really a lot of fun. This next weekend is a secondhand weekend as we prepare for our 2023 flea market. So if you've got some time on Saturday and or Sunday morning, Folks will be over in the multi-purpose gym putting things together, and we hope that you'll come join us and help us with that. Today starts our summer travel series with the Apostle Paul. Today I'm going to start with the letter of Galatians. Uh, so each week it'll be kind of fun and different, and I hope that you'll join us each week in person or online. And my hope is that you'll read the book that we're talking about in the midst of that. It's in the Kiva newsletter. It's here. Uh, and then I'm going to do something new. On Tuesdays at noon, using the online source of Zoom, I'm going to offer what I call Talk About It Tuesday. So Tuesdays at noon, you can come on Zoom with me on the computer, and we're going to talk about the sermon from today. We're going to talk about the letter of Galatians. We're going to go a little bit deeper. We're going to ask questions and answer questions and come up with new questions and just kind of go a little bit deeper on what we're talking about today. So if you'd like to join me with that, I hope you will do so. Let's, uh, let me introduce to you Linda Updike, who is our guest musician today. She's just a wonderful player, a great heart. She's been a worship leader here for a lot of years. Um, <laughs> and um, it's just been wonderful to get ready for worship with her. And let's use Linda's music to get us into a sense of spirit and centered and ready for worship.
Good morning. My name is Laura Manning, for those of you that don't know me, and I have been calling this place my church home since 2010, and I've loved every minute of it. And I'm excited to be with you today, because today, well, it's the 4th of July weekend, isn't it? And we celebrate our independence, our country's freedom. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I take for granted that we can gather right here and worship. And sometimes I forget that the first one who gave us freedom was God through Jesus. So today is a special day of worship, a day where we can rejoice in our freedoms from God, our salvation, where we don't have to worry about, am I gonna be okay? What happens to me after this life? We're free. Jesus paid that price for us. And we are free in this country to come and worship, to gather together. And there is nothing like being together with our Christian family to worship. So today is a day to rejoice and be happy. And we need to start that out by singing. Whether you can rise physically or in spirit, let your heart sing the words of our hymn as we join our musician. Amen.
You may be seated. Let us pray together. Lord, we humbly thank you for being the guide to our founding fathers and mothers who established this amazing country for all people. They put their trust in you. That was the foundation for our nation. Today we know that we sometimes lose sight of that, that you are our foundation. And we forget to put you first. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us for getting so busy in our lives that we forget you are all around us and that you are in us and with us. So today, Lord, forgive us for that and help us as we learn more about the freedom you have given us, the salvation that Jesus provided for us so that we can be your emissaries, that we too can be the instruments to carry your peace and your grace, now, forever. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together in worship, to be with our church family, so that we can grow closer to you and remember your desires for us your love for us, and your grace. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, so welcome. Welcome to our summer series, Traveling with Paul. I hope that you can save on some gas. I hope you don't have to wait in line for a canceled flight. I hope that you'll join us here as we travel in July and August. We're going to be looking at the epistles of Paul from the New Testament. Epistle is a great big seminary word that just means letters. You know, every vocation likes to have its fancy words, right? But they're letters that Paul wrote to or from or about churches that he had established. And each week in July and August, we're going to look at a different one of them. So I'm inviting you each week to read the fullness of that book, that letter of the New Testament, so you get an overall flavor of it as well um, and a sense of what that is. I'm inviting you to join us each week in uh, worship, whether you're in person or online, as I'm going to highlight some things from the book. I'm not going to do everything from each letter. Uh, but kind of give us an overview. And then I really do hope that you'll join me online on Zoom on Tuesdays at noon, Tucson time, for a Talk About It Tuesday. And we'll reflect on the sermon from today, this coming Tuesday. So that starts uh, very soon. Uh, 
I want to introduce you to Paul. I want to tell you a little bit about Paul as we get going. Experts tell us that he was probably born somewhere around 5 AD and died somewhere around 64 or 65 AD. It's really hard to know all of those dates. There's no exact gravestone for him with it etched in. Uh, but from best historical records, that's what experts are telling us. Not sure exactly how or where Paul died, uh, but most likely he was martyred. He was killed on behalf of his faith. We do know that both of his parents were Jewish. However, he had something very special about his dad. His dad was a very well-educated Pharisee person. Those, you hear a lot about the Pharisees in the New Testament. Jesus has a lot to say to the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees were the people that were the overseers of the law, of the Mosaic Jewish law. Uh, and they were there to make sure that everybody followed and understood every jot and tittle of the law. So Paul's dad was probably a stickler for the law. He was a very smart, well-educated man, and we know that because of that, one of the things that he found favor with was the governing ro ruler of Rome, and he was made a Roman citizen. So Paul's dad was a Roman citizen, even though his mom was not. Now you have to know that Rome owned the whole territory, and I'll show you that territory in just a moment. There is the old uh, kind of, I think, misunderstanding of his name. Uh, lots of people call him Saul. Lots of people call him Paul. Lots of people like to go back to the story on the road to Damascus and think that that's a big moment when he changed his name. Remember that as Saul grew up as a Jew, he found favor with the rulers and favor in not a very favorable way. He decided that any of those people who had become Christians, those people that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, should be killed. His job was to eradicate this new movement of people of the way of Christianity. That was his job, and he was really good at it. And one day he was traveling up to the city of Damascus to do another mass murder uh, and uh, met the risen Christ, remember? Uh, and um, in the midst of that, found himself a Christian. And he moved from being one of the greatest persecutors of Christianity into the one of the greatest evangelizers of Christianity. It's there that a lot of people, I think, get confused. You, they think Saul became Paul at that moment. That's really not true. Remember, mom and dad were Jewish. Dad had Roman citizenship. So when Saul was born, he was named Saul. It's a Jewish name. Dad gets Roman citizenship, and all dad's Roman people call him Paul. So when Paul is in the presence of dad's Roman friends, they refer to him as Paul. When he's with his mom and dad with their Jewish friends, they called him Saul. And that remained all of his life. The difference came for him when he realized that God was not just transforming his own faith and life, but using him to evangelize to the world that his particular calling was to evangelize to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And most of the Gentiles kind of aligned themselves, they had to, with Rome. And so they would have related to him better by calling him Paul than his Jewish name, Saul, because they weren't Jewish. So he becomes most popular as Paul simply because his whole calling was to the non-Jewish people. But all along through his life, he was Saul and Paul. This is the area that we're talking about. Galatia is way up here. Know that this is Jerusalem, so this is where Jesus is walking and talking and doing his thing. Um, these are all the journeys of Paul, the vacations that Paul took. Um, this is the area of Galatia up in here, okay? It's that kind of southwestern uh, Asia Minor territory uh, of the land. And there were a lot of churches that Paul had started up there. We think that the letter to Galatians was written somewhere in the 50s AD. Now, most of us, when we write letters, will date them, right? Paul didn't. And we don't have his original letters exactly. 
And so they have to do some historical studies in the books and see what he's mentioning. And most of our biblical experts think that this book was written somewhere in the 50s AD. There was a major controversy, which is why he wrote it. And remember, he visited the territory. He evangelized uh, Jesus as the Messiah. People began to believe, and they began then to start house churches, lots of them, right? And so then Paul would be in a place, start a church, and then he'd leave, and he'd move on. And he'd get other correspondence about what was going on over here in the churches that he started. And what he heard was some things that started to sound different than what he had taught them. You know, the fish was a whopper and took hours to bring in. You know how people are when they tell stories. The stories begin to change. But Paul didn't want the story of Jesus to change. So he wrote back to churches to correct them and to correct some of the things that they were misunderstanding. There was a major controversy going on in the churches of Galatia. And that was the difference between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Gentile Christians, Gentiles in particular, are anybody who's not Jewish. Jewish Christians were those who were Jews by, by birth and grown up and believed this Jesus was the Messiah. Gentile Christians were those that he evangelized who had been outside the faith and became Christians as well. And the Jewish Christians who had spent all their life following the law of Moses, the Jewish traditions, decided that because they had had to do all of that stuff, so should the non-Jews. And Paul had said, no, that's not exactly right. Let me uh, share with you a little bit of his letter. Because I love the way Paul writes uh, to people. He is a master at beginning with buttering you up. And then baking you. So listen to the opening verses of the first chapter of Galatians. He writes, Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. What's he trying to say right then and there? I'm it. You all didn't appoint me. God and Jesus appointed me. And don't you just kind of sit back and say, woo, to those people, right? I mean, I could stand before you and say that you all voted me to be your pastor, or I could come to you and tell me, God said I will be your pastor. <laughs> now I know your reaction to that, and it isn't quite the reaction that Paul got. But anyway, he sets himself up as a legitimate apostle here. He goes on and says, from God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead and all the members of God's family who are with me to the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Isn't he a beautiful writer? He sets you up. You are lifted high and holy, and then get ready, because he's going to bake you over this controversy. Okay? So the churches in Galatia are all wrapped up in this weird controversy about what it is uh, and what it really means. Um, yeah, it would be good for me to have it in order here. He goes on to say some really interesting, interesting things about the law of Moses. He really says to them that the law that God gave us through Moses was a law that took us so far. And following that law was our way of showing God that we loved and cared for God. It was our way of finding favor with God, right? But now Paul will want us to know that the law and following it can only take us so far because the reality is humans don't follow the law all the time. How many of you go 76 on the freeway between here and Phoenix? When you're only supposed to go 75, right? Oh, it's just one mile over. 
two, three, four, eight, <laughs> right? We humans are terrible at following all the jots and tittles of the law, and Paul knew that, and God knew that. And that's a part of why God came to us in Jesus, because we were never going to get ourselves right with God simply by following the law. And so God made us right with God by coming to us in Jesus through our faith. In chapter 2, verse 16, let me get to it, Paul writes this. We know all of that other stuff, but we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul wants us to know that our faith in God through Jesus as the Christ is what is most important, and that is how God is making us right with God. And so all these controversies about having to follow the law are for Paul, in a sense, rather silly. Because it isn't following the law anymore that will make us right with God. And so... He comes to the most important part of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29, where in the very midst of it, at verse 26, he says this, For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God. Now that was something they had not known before. Because you see, the Israelite Jews were the children of God. Paul came along and said, oh, by the way, all of us have been made in the image and likeness of God equally. We are all children of God, equally. And God treats and loves us equally. So he writes back to the church in Galatia, and he says, we are all one in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Greek is simply a term that Paul uses for non-Jews. So he says there's no longer Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. We're all one in Christ. This is what Paul has learned. And he goes on to, to kind of open that up and say, we've got to treat each other equally. Now, could Paul not recognize the difference between a man and a woman? <laughs> Did he not know the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew? Did he not know the difference between somebody who was a slave and somebody who was a free? No. Paul wasn't saying that there isn't any more, you can't tell the difference between a man and a woman, you can't tell the difference between a slave and a free. What he was saying is, here's three ways, O oh church in Galatia, that you are not treating each other equally. Jews and non-Jews had equal access to God through Jesus. Not through the law, through their faith in Jesus. Men and women had equally been made in the image and likeness of God. Not just men, women too, who in biblical times didn't have rights of ownership unless they had a husband or a dad or a brother. He was pointing out to them three ways in their community that they were not treating people with equality and challenging them that they needed to do so because all are one in Christ. Now, he goes on, and he reminds them that because of what we have learned in Jesus, because of our faith in Jesus, we are free to be one. But our freedom isn't just for ourselves. He goes on to say, in verse 13 of chapter 5, You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, and notice he includes sisters. Most of the writings were to brothers. Okay? Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul was so transformed by his meeting with the risen Christ and the grace that he found in the story of God and Jesus that what he discovered is that grace is open for everybody. And everybody 
is welcome in the story of God. That was his goal. That was the dream that he had to share. It was the goal and dreams of our four ancestors here in this country. When Western Europeans came and settled, right? Land of the free, home of the brave, we call it. They came here for freedom for everybody because they didn't have it where they had come from. Most of those who had come were probably Christians and had based their goals of freedom on the Christian freedoms that Paul was talking about here in his letter to Galatians. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It's an important foundation of our country. When you read Paul in some of his other letters, you're going to soon realize, make sure you're here when we do Ephesians, that Paul didn't fully understand this himself. Because Paul will say to women, be quiet and go home. He'll tell women, you have to cover your heads in worship because men don't have to because they're made in the image of God, not the woman. He'll tell slaves to just be content with being a slave. You see, the reality is, this whole thing about God and Jesus is so mind-blowing that even Paul, the greatest evangelism of all time, didn't fully understand the equality about which he was talking. And this great experience of these United, uh, experiment of these United States, even our forebearers didn't fully understand what full freedom was all about. Lest I remind you, when our forebearers, most of our forebearers, came to this country, established it, and tried to modernize it, there were already people living here. Lest I remind you what we did to their culture and their freedom, why we tried to gain our own. Our Constitution tells us that all men are created equal which is why women didn't get the vote until the 1920s. Right? Which is why people of African descent who were stolen from their own countries and enslaved here were not freed until the 1800s and didn't get to vote until the mid-1900s. Even our own forebearers in our country of freedom did not fully understand the power of freedom of God in Jesus the Christ. They didn't fully understand what Paul was saying, that there is no longer Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. We are one in Christ. We are learning all the time what that means. Paul says, when we learn to live this way, we will flow with the fruits of God's Spirit. And our lives will be all about love and joy and peace, patience and kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wouldn't it be nice if we all lived like that? Wouldn't it be nice if our nation was like that all the time? What a beacon to the world it could be. What a beacon to the world it has been. as our ancestors have fought for freedom, not just for us in this country, but freedom for people all around the world. Isn't it humbling to be a part of this nation who still doesn't fully understand what freedom means? With liberty and justice for all, we say, not just for some. Paul begins to end his epistle by writing this. Bear, with, bear one another's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is how we should live. It is my contention that none of us are free until all of us are free. And we have people in our own nation and people around the world who are not free. who are crying out for help. And sometimes we look at them and we say, oh, all you want is special privileges. No. 
all they're asking for is equality. And anywhere and any place that we as Christians see inequality, we have to be about changing that. Because Paul's right. When we're in Christ, when we realize that we are all children of God, that we are all equally made in the image and likeness of God, that God loves every one of us equally, then we have to treat each other equally. We have to live equally amongst one another. And we shall only be free when all are free. Garth Brooks wrote an amazing song about that that I want to sing for you uh, with Linda's help. It's a song called We Shall Be Free. This ain't coming from no prophet. I'm just an ordinary man. When I close my eyes, I see the way this world shall be. When we all walk hand in hand. When the last child cries for a crust of bread, when the last man dies for just words that he said, when there's shelter over the poorest head, we shall be free. When the last thing we notice is the color of skin, and the first thing we look for is the beauty within. When the skies and the oceans are clean again, then we shall be free. We shall be free. We shall be free. Stand straight, walk proud, cause we shall be free when we're free to love anyone we choose when this world's big enough for all different views when we all can worship from our own kind of pews then we shall be free we shall be free, we shall be free. Have a little faith, hold out, cause we shall be free. And when money talks for the very last time, and nobody walks a step behind when there's only one race and that's humankind then we shall be free we shall be free we shall be free stand straight have a little faith cuz we shall be free. We shall be free. We shall be free. Walk proud. Have a little faith, cause we shall be free. Folks, I believe it with my whole being. None of us are free until we're all free. And we shall be free when we're all free. So we as Christians get to live that way in the love of God and Jesus the Christ. And this is where we get to begin. 
This is where we realize that none of us deserve to be here. None of us. But all of us are offered a place at the table. You don't get to decide that. God does. And God calls every one of us, as different as we are, to be here. So as Christians, we come and we practice that equality here at the table. So come today. For those who are worshiping online, make sure you've got your bread and juice of some sort ready. And as you see us partake of communion here at the table, we invite you to partake, to get that sense that we really are together, even over the internet. For those of you who are in the room, this side of the room, we're going to ask you to come up this aisle and come around and down here. Here you're going to partake of the bread as soon as it's given to you. Here you're going to partake of the cup as soon as it's given to you. Those on this side, come on up around here and down here and then back up to your seats. You'll see a plastic bin for your cups here at, uh, on the stations just as you pass after you've taken your cup and you can be seated. Come, you unworthy beings. And know that God has made us all equal in the image and likeness of God. How awesome is that? Let's pray. Precious and holy God, we really do know that we don't deserve to be here. But we crave to be at this table because especially at this communion table where we remember how Jesus opened up his life so completely that we want to be a part of it. We want to be fully wrapped in your grace and in your love and filled with your spirit so that our whole living will show the world your loving that we know of in Jesus. We are sorry for the ways that we have kept people from this table. Guide us through your spirit now to welcome everybody here. Lord our God, you are more than amazing. Work away within us as we taste of the bread and taste of the cup and, and we take these elements deeper within us so that every part of who we are is nourished with your grace and proclaims who you are in Jesus the Christ. Thank you for coming to us in him. We love you too. And we commit ourselves to following Jesus as he leads us into your fullness. Bind us together now as one people, God. As we sing together the prayer that your son gave us. Our Father, who art in
into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I invite our communion servers to come join me at the table. And as they do, I remind you, folks, those of you who've got it all figured out, you're welcome here. Those who've figured out, you'll never figure it all out, you're welcome here too. Those who've been in this journey for a long time and those who may just be restarting that journey today, you're welcome. Those of you who are not even one year old and those the rest of us that are nearing a hundred. <laughs> You're welcome here at this table. Those who are having a really wonderful day and those who are just barely breathing through the day. You're welcome here at the table. This is the table that none of us deserve to be at. And yet all of us are welcome to be at. God has come to us in Jesus the Christ to show us how much we are loved. Just love God back. It'll be okay. Remember how Jesus took the bread? He blessed and he broke it. He offered it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. As they continued into their meal, he took the cup that was before them, pouring it out. He said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink from it. What we know it is that we partake of this bread and drink from this cup. We proclaim Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection, and our commitment to him until he comes again and shows us what it's really all about. And until then, may we show him that we're at least getting some glimpses and doing what we can to live in that fullness. Come now and be nourished at the table. Why don't you walk around? Come, all the way around, come down. Give yourself some space in between for those worshiping online. Partake, our hearts are with you as you partake at home or wherever you are. Those in the room who it's too hard for you to travel down here to the table, stay where you are. And we have a couple of people who will come to you. Just give them a gentle wave so that they can see where you are. And they'll come to you sometime throughout the communion serving.
Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your incredible grace. Undeserved, but welcomed in our lives. May every time we come to this table, may our faith grow deeper in you. May it carry us through all our days and nights ahead that we can learn to live in the light of your grace in Jesus Christ now and forevermore. Amen. Oh yeah, we're supposed to sing. <laughs> Sorry. Let's rise and sing, let there be peace on earth. <laughs> can join the choir and be seated. We come now to our time of offering. And I want to start by thanking all of you, all of you, for being such generous givers. One of the things that drew me to this church and keeps me here is the fact that we do so many good mission work projects to all people. We reach out to the community. There's so many ways that we give. Look at your bulletin. Just this week they have a list of the missions that are going on. That's just one week and it's just a small fraction of what we do. Look at Mount Lure Camp last week. How wonderful was that? to hear those children rejoicing, learning about Jesus and having fun. And just last night, our mission team served a meal to the Fisher House. That's, for those of you that don't know, that's kind of like the Ronald McDonald House when we have veterans who are in the hospital and their families need to de be nearby. This takes care of them and, and our people served and we can do those things because of your giving. Now your bulletin also tells you many ways that you can give financially. You can drop money in the offering plate, write checks, you can do bill pay, you can go online, it tells you how to do that. Thank you. Thank you for being faithful in doing that. And thank you also for the other ways that you serve. 
literally serve our Lord. Now let me tell you something. I'm from Virginia, and my daddy was a World War II vet. And the 4th of July, we celebrated. We had parades up and down the town, 8,000 people, all members of my community right on the North Carolina-Virginia border, all came to that parade. We celebrated at home. We had fireworks. We had community gatherings to celebrate the independence and to celebrate those who serve. So I am always going to be grateful to the men and women of our military. Back from the 1776, because you know we thought we were the bed, the beginning of our nation in Virginia. All the way back there, we celebrated the sacrifice that people were being willing to make for the good of others. All the way up through current military, we showed our gratitude. And that's not the only way we serve people in this country, is it? There are people in this church, most of you, who find a way to get involved and to serve others. Others that we now know are part of our family. Oh, we siblings sometimes don't get along, right? We squabble, we have differences of opinion, but when we join hands, when we have the table set before us and we join in communion together, we realize we are all one in God and that our differences, they just ain't that important. We are the children of God and for that I am most grateful. Two freedoms we celebrate this weekend, our freedom given through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and the freedom that this country provides us to worship and to live in freedom. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the blessings you have given us. We ask today that as we give back, that you guide us in being good stewards of those blessings and those gifts you have given us. We ask that our gifts, our very selves, be used as the instruments of your grace, that we may love our neighbors and all of creation and spread your peace and love throughout this nation and beyond. Bless us all, Lord. Make us worthy. Help us, even in the times where we are not exactly perfect, to look to you and find you in our hearts and in our neighbors. And thank you for giving us our Christian family. We seek your blessings and we offer our gratitude today. In the name of Jesus Christ, your son, amen. If Paul were writing to the church of today, He would say there is neither Jew or Gentile still. Now see, remember, Paul was pointing out to the church in Galatia three ways that they weren't living in equality with each other. It is our responsibility as Christians to look for that in our own society, in our own world, and show the world where we are not living in equality and make it so. God has made us all in God's image, and we shall be free when we are all free. Find those spaces, those places, those isms, those prejudices, those inequalities in life, and make sure we get rid of them. And don't just say that we're all one in Christ. Let's make sure we're living that way. Amen.